Jen Fairburn for inviting me to talk tonight and also to congratulate them for putting on a really extraordinary show. I hope you've had some time to go through the exhibit next door. I think Spencer really sort of nailed it when he said an opening night that you really have the presence of the man um, in, in working, walking through that, that space. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with the really unique strategy that uh, James and Jen took in, in contextualizing his images within a kind of larger visual culture. It really, really works well. So congratulations. So when James uh, contacted me this summer to talk about, uh, well, to talk during this uh, lecture, I was very enthusiastic, very excited, but quickly found myself struggling on how to kind of approach the topic. It seemed to me that the traditional or historical uh, shtick of contextualizing his work within this or that school or you know, providing the definitive interpretation of his images just didn't seem terribly meaningful in, in light of the, the circumstances. Um, so I decided to approach this in a more conceptual way and to talk about the relationship of photography and memory because I think this really kind of embodies our position uh, looking back at David Allen's life through, through his images. And then after spending some time with his work, reading his thesis, you know, I quickly realized that just as luck would have it, uh, he too was very interested in these themes, and these were sort of the predominant themes, I would say, running through his work in many respects. So I hope my lecture tonight will kind of amplify the experience you have uh, next door in, in the show. Before I dive in, I want to say a couple words about the structure and my approach to the subject, because memory is a sort of difficult subject to pin down, right? It's usually defined in distinction to history. History pursues a kind of universal record of the past, uh, maybe even a, an objective record of the past, even though it obviously rarely attains that. Whereas memory is this highly individualized, subjective, fluid, slippery, dynamic sort of realm, which is really difficult to pin down or, or analyze in any kind of totalizing way. Uh, but that's also what makes it so interesting and exciting to, to I think, especially visual culture. So my lecture is going to be uh, a kind of layering of historical references um, that's going to jump around in time and work through you know, nonlinear connections more than a kind of linear argument to preserve that quality of, of memory. So having said that, I have two things I really want to accomplish with my lecture tonight. Uh, first, I want to trace a brief cultural history of memory, uh, looking at the beginnings of the theory of memory and the practice of memory, memory. And we'll be going to a time well before photography to have that conversation. And then I want to look for the intersections between this narrative and photography. How does the medium of photography overlap, or where does it overlap? How do those narratives sort of intersect with, with one another? <clears throat> okay, so I want to begin this conversation by going back to the classical world, uh, to a time well before photography, at least in its modern form, uh, to a time when memory is beginning to be sort of theorized and maybe most importantly for us, codified in a very distinct way. And I'm going to offer three reference points to build this sort of cultural history of memory that I, that I mentioned earlier. The first is the story of Simonides. So Simonides was a Greek poet who was hired by the nobleman Scopus to deliver a poem at a banquet. This poem was to honor a certain boxer that uh, Scopus was particularly fond of. Simonides writes his poem, delivers it at the banquet. In the course of delivering this poem, he goes off on a bit of a tangent and begins to praise Castor and Pollock, the sort of archetypes of the boxer mold. And at the end of the poem, Scopus refuses to pay the full amount and only pays half because Simonides had not sufficiently praised the boxer that Scopus wanted him to write the poem for. Not long after, Simonides is approached by a young Greek slave and says, who says, you have two visitors waiting for you outside. Simonides goes outside, and if you know much about Greek mythology, you know where this is going. Uh, he goes outside, there's no one there, and at that very moment, the banquet hall collapses behind him, uh, killing everyone inside, conveniently enough. Obviously, the two guests were Castor and Pollux, right? 
who were punishing the noblemen for not sufficiently praising the gods and saving Simonides for uh, giving reference to Castor and Pollux. So what's important about this narrative, though, is what happens next, at least for our purposes tonight. Um, the relatives of those who died in the collapse of the banquet hall are unable to identify the remains of their loved ones. So they call upon Simonides, who mentally works through the seating arrangement of that night in order to identify the remains. Now, this story will become this sort of building block for uh, what the Romans will call the Ars Memorae, uh, the art of, of memory. So as you probably know, in ancient Rome, the technique of speech giving was a highly revered sort of art form, right? It was a, a major part of a young man's education to learn the techniques of persuasion, point of view, delivery, etc. the field of, of rhetoric, right? Um, but a big part of this was also learning how to internalize often lengthy speeches. And there are a number of textbooks that were dedicated to this very phenomenon. Uh, really a handful. One of the most important was written by a guy named Quintilian. He begins his story, I mean, sorry, his textbook with this very story. From what Simonides did on that occasion, it appears to have been remarked that the memory is assisted by localities impressed on the mind, and everyone seems able to attest the truth of the observation from his own experience. For when we return to places after an absence of some time, we not only recognize them, but recollect also what we did in them. So Quintilian introduces this story, and then he goes on to expound upon his particular method of internalizing speeches, which is sometimes called the Roman room method or the journey method. Essentially, it works like this. You envision an architectural space, a large space, a mansion, a castle, and for particularly large uh, speeches, long speeches, you sometimes envision an actual city. Each room within this imaginary interior space is dedicated to a given idea. Think of it in terms of a kind of architectural paragraph or something. And inside of the room, you place, again, all in the sort of imaginary sphere, uh, a set of image, images that are dedicated to the points you want to raise to prove the larger argument of that particular room. And so when it comes time to deliver your speech, you simply mentally walk through this interior space gaze at the images like a sort of museum goer, and all of the finer points of your speech are sort of prompted by images. So there's a, something very important about this for the discussion tonight. First of all, this proves that memory is spatialized, right? We, we sort of conceptualize memory through spatial relations in a variety of media. Uh, architecture maybe being the first, but certainly this recirculates throughout so many of our, of our media today. Um, and also this idea that memory is wed to images. And this idea really travels through all the way to the present moment. We have the Renaissance memory theaters. Uh, this is one by Camillo. It's frankly a very bizarre system he's developed here. Uh, he is interested in encapsulating the entirety of human history in a single sort of spatial architectural relationship. It's based on Kabbalism, numerology, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but the real sort of origin or source for this is the Roman room method, the, the, the method of loci that I talked about later, earlier. And then we have later uh, contemporary forms of memory theater. This is a sort of modern remake of the Italian Renaissance version where certain uh, metaphors or metonymies really are substitute, contemporary uh, references are substituted for the Renaissance method. And here it's really about exposing the limitations of the museum and its capacity for memory. And maybe even more familiar to you all, hopefully, is uh, the work of Christian Boltanski, who often draws upon these, I these ideas of the memory theater using found photographs from uh, the children who disappeared during World War II. So all of this sort of takes on an additional layer when I introduce my third anecdote from the classical world. And this is Aristotle's text on memory and reminiscence. So we've already established that in the very early formulation of memory, the practice of memory, um, this experience is spatialized, wed to the image, and so on. And once we begin to read Aristotle's text with a little bit of uh, leeway, we'll see that maybe this has a sort of special relationship to, to photography. So in this text, Aristotle 
develops this very famous metaphor of the signet ring. And essentially, he uses this metaphor to describe the way that perception works, that light enters the eye and impresses upon this layer of wax that's internal to the psyche and leaves a kind of impression in it. Um, if you've read Plato, you can tell he's borrowing this whole idea of the wax metaphor from Plato, twisting it a bit. And he's, it comes about in the context of Aristotle trying to differentiate form and matter. He says, in this relationship, the indentation left on the wax is the perfect transcription of form, and yet the matter, the substance of the thing is missing. So what's important for us, though, is Aristotle also says that this is the way memory works, that we essentially return to these impressions and give life to them in the process of remembering. So hopefully you're beginning to make the connection yourself here. There's something almost photographic about the way this process is described, a negative impression that the rememberer then returns to and sort of gives a positive imprint to create a kind of presence, right? Sounds very photographic. Aristotle also says that memory is relational. And he says this very succinctly. He says, we don't remember C, we remember A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? You remember your childhood kitchen, you remember the view out the window, and then the tree in the backyard, and all sorts of associations, right, that sort of build the past. And it's a kind of movement rather than recollecting a singular sort of, sort of image. And in this movement, he says that memory is particularly well suited to the slow type. The fast, frenet frenetic, frenzied type have a hard time, and actually he describes it in terms of their layer of wax being thinner, uh, that they can't, they can't maintain those impressions in the same way that the slow individual can. And so if we sort of extend that to its logical conclusion, perhaps, maybe, a perfect stillness is sort of the embodiment, the ideal image for memory. So all of this I sort of bring together to throw out the speculative idea that memory itself is photographic, at least the way it's conceived and practiced in the classical world, and I think to some extent the way we understand it and experience it today. And maybe, actually, the better way to describe this is to say that photography is mnemonic, right? Photography is born out of a certain cultural understanding and practice of, of memory. So when we look at the early photographic practices, this is kind of borne out. Um, from the beginning, photography is understood as a medium that has a special relationship to the past. And there are so many ways to, to go with this. I'm just going to sort of list some of the potential avenues you can use to confirm this idea. The first is that it was very prevalent to have photographs of the deceased uh, in jewelry, lockets, and so on, and housed within, with artifacts of the deceased person's body. So hair, fingernails, um, even clothing that were to be touched when you, when you opened the, the photograph. And even uh, Elizabeth Edwards, a, a contemporary art historian, talks a lot about the way the jewelry itself is designed. It has this sort of tactile quality to it. You want to run your finger across it. Um, and so tactility was a way to sort of make the connections between the present and the past and kind of elicit this power of memory that photographs seem to, to maintain. There's also a whole dialogue where we can talk about, oh, let me mention one more set of images. Um, as you probably know, the early photographs were also often used as brooches and lockets and whatnot that were held close to the body. Uh, and they're supposed to sort of elicit a kind of exchange, a bodily exchange between the wearer and the remembered person, right? And sort of a heat uh, being transferred between the two of them, almost like a kind of embrace. There's also this uh, connection almost immediately in early photography between the medium and death. And it has a lot to do with the particular technical limitations of photography at the time. Um, because of the extended exposure times, it was very difficult to, say, go in the middle of a bustling city and take a snapshot of that activity, right? We're talking about six, eight minute exposures. Um, you would capture either nothing or a series of blurs. And so just by sort of happenstance, a particularly photographic friendly environment was the graveyard, uh, which was a controlled environment, right, where you could pretty much assure there wouldn't be a lot of activity. Um, also, the, the experience of sitting for a photograph 
was an interesting one, one which is very different from today. Because of these extended exposure times, one had to almost sort of train their body to take on a kind of immobility. And if you look at photographs of families in particular, uh, the children are usually blurry, <laughs> and the adults are somewhat sharp focused, because of course it's very hard for them to sit still. Uh, many photographers devise these elaborate systems, these braces to hold the sitter perfectly still for an extended period of time. And in this experience, it was almost a kind of prefiguration of one's death, as if you sort of assumed a kind of rigor mortis in front of the camera. Um, we also know that 19th century photography uh, was used in funeral practices, uh, the post-mortem genre. This sounds very strange to us today, but it was not at all unusual for the recently deceased to be photographed, especially children with their mothers. Um, also, spirit photography, uh, one of the highest selling genres in the 19th century were photographs of, of ghosts, mm -hmm. in, in quotes, right? So from the beginning, this medium is sort of uh, positioned to look backwards, right? And we can also talk about uh, forensic photography and, and the birth of the mugshot, which happens very, very quickly in the 19th century, the, the mid-19th century, and think of that in terms of a kind of infiltration or outsourcing of memory uh, that we're all kind of familiar with today even the way that photographs are used in the psychiatric community in the 19th century. Again, very quickly, with people like uh, Dr. Hugh Welch Diamond Charcot, who was one of uh, Freud's teacher, teachers, used photography to document the physical symptoms of uh, hysteria in particular. Um, so this was intended to create a kind of guidebook for other physicians, other psychiatrists, to then internalize, memorize, and then apply to their own patients. So if we look at these, this sort of joint constellation between the inner workings of photography, maintaining this really close association to the early formulations of, of memory, and also the way photography is practiced uh, from, its, from its inception, this all kind of comes together in this very curious phrase that I'm going to spend some time kind of deconstructing and playing with. And that phrase is a photographic memory, right? We use this phrase to describe a kind of perfect memory, whatever that means. It's almost a kind of paradoxical um, idea. And interestingly enough, I just found out about an hour ago, I went to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, and found out the first mention of the phrase photographic memory is, anyone want to take a guess? Sounds so modern, right? 1850. So really from the beginning of photography, this, this medium has kind of collapsed with memory, right? To say one's mind is photographic is to say that it has a very developed sense of, of memory. So I think that's very telling. And it's a phrase or a concept that we still have today. And, and just to give you a sort of handful of contemporary films where you see photography presented in this way, uh, hopefully you've seen some of these. Memento, where the main character is suffering from amnesia. His only real way to sort of ground himself in relation to the past is through the Polaroid images that he has. Uh, everything is illuminated. The young character is sort of the perfect, ideal family historian. He gathers all the artifacts from the family's past. And a large part of this is uh, photographic based. And my favorite example. Um, which some of you might not reference or be familiar with, uh, Back to the Future, where Marty McFly is transported to the past, and when he's there, he catches the eye of his mother, very Freudian twist, um, and in the process, prevents his mother from meeting his father and thereby indirectly threatens his own existence, right? And throughout the film, the photograph is used as a kind of ticking time bomb for him to make this relationship Happen. So a kind of one-to-one -one relationship between the photograph and memory. Okay, so at this point though, I want to kind of problematize this idea of a photographic memory. Um, I started off by talking about how slippery memory is, what a dynamic field it is. The past is always sort of in motion, being recast according to the present, etc. And yet we have this term, photographic memory, which speaks to a kind of encapsulation, right? It's, it's a preservation, of, a perfect preservation of, of, of the past. One of the things I like to do in my uh, theory of photography class, and actually I begin the class this way, is to talk about all the ways in which photography does not reproduce our sensory experience of the world. 
right? Um, we still cling to this idea of it being a sort of objective, neutral record of our world, and yet when we think intellectually about it, it's a really poor approximation of our visual experience of the world, right? And usually I have a student at the board listing all of these elements, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, obviously the distortion in space that happens in photography, the very fact that it's a rectangle, right? We all know our peripheral view is a very rich component of our visual experience of the world. Photography does not really approxim approximate that, right, in the way that film sometimes, sometimes can. And maybe even most importantly, the idea of photo photography being a still image, right? We don't see in still images. We have to kind of remind ourselves of that. Even though people for people like Descartes, for example, believed that we kind of did. Um, he integrated a cow's eyeball into his camera obscura, placed it in the part where the lens usually goes, walked inside, and believed he had sort of perfectly formulated organic vision and sort of inorganic terms, right? And that there was a sort of an image uh, on the back wall that was projected in sort of self-contained fashion. Really what happens with vision, in the last few decades, scientists have basically confirmed this, is we never really see a static image. We never really even see a total image. What happens is the eye randomly samples the visual environment, and we mentally assemble a sense of the whole, a sense of totality, right? So this whole premise of photography is really so foreign to the way we see the world, and yet it maintains this kind of sense of uh, fidelity. So I want to try to make these two things jive here a bit. Um, if photography maybe is not necessarily involved in reproducing the eye, maybe it's involved in a more dynamic conception of memory. And I want to explore this idea by turning to um, oh, wait, before I do that, let me talk about this next slide. Uh, Sigmund Freud, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I want to mention this too. One of the things I do in my theory of photography class is to reproduce uh, Brunelleschi's experiment with a photograph. Um, those of you who are familiar with this, you know that Brunelleschi, uh, the pivotal Renaissance figure, um, set up shop in Florence, painted the perfect painting of the Florence Baptistry, and then poked a hole in it so that the viewer would look through the hole of the painting and see the actual baptistry, and then pass a mirror in front, and the two would be perfectly indistinguishable. So the story goes. And Brunelleschi wowed everyday pedestrians in Florence, and this was sort of the penultimate Renaissance moment in many, in many ways. Uh, photographs do not really stand up to this test in the least bit, and yet we still kind of privilege them over painting in terms of their fidelity to, to reality. So let's muddy the water here a bit, and let's talk about Freud's idea of memory, and maybe we can sort of reconcile uh, the version of photography I've just, I've just presented to you. If we have to condense Freud's very prolific career and continual discussion of memory to a single sort of point, maybe the most important thing is that Freud does not believe there's any such thing as forgetting, right? At least the way we normally think of it. For Freud, all of the past is preserved in the unconscious. And what we call forgetting is really a motivated repression. Everything, everything is contained in the unconscious. He tells a story of uh, continually misplacing his keys when he is supposed to go visit a particular friend. And this happens three or four times, and finally he has to sort of get real with himself and realize he did not want to see this friend. And it was an intervention you know, of his subconscious to prevent that from happening. And of course, this is maybe more dramatic with, with traumatic memories, which can be repressed for, for decades and then resurface in catastrophic uh, fashion. So I want to talk about two of uh, Freud's metaphors and their failed metaphors. Uh, Freud likes to do this a lot. He'll throw out a metaphor and he'll say, but no, it doesn't actually really work that well, but it, it's close. Um, and these are actually, I think, the, the best parts of his writing in many, many respects. The first metaphor he uses to describe this relationship is uh, the mystic writing pad. So you're all familiar with this children's toy. It existed in Freud's time uh, in pretty similar fashion. The only difference was that there was a wax uh, substrate underneath the layers on top. So you write on the magic slate, you draw pictures, and then you pull back the top layer, and of course it's erased, and you can start a new drawing. What's interesting about this is not only that the images can be erased, 
but that, that substrate of wax contains a hint of all previous transcriptions, right? Even though on the surface, they're sort of unattainable or inaccessible, there's a sense of the kind of totality of all past transcriptions residing in this subterranean level. And hopefully you can see how Freudian this, this idea is. But he does talk about uh, the limitations of this metaphor. I, I mentioned this as a, a failed metaphor, as, as Freud put it. And the problem with it is, for Freud, is that there are limitations to how many inscriptions the magic slate can, uh, can handle. And this, of course, is not like the, the psyche itself, which has unlimited capacity for new transcription. Um, except in those cases where, and Freud is one of the first people to really work with uh, veterans after World War I, he talks about that top layer being damaged and there's no longer the ability to sort of maintain memories because of the shock of that experience and whatnot. Well, this work on the uh, left by Arnold Dreblot uh, is a, a kind of rejoinder, I guess you could say, to Freud because he presents that same relationship of the magic slate, this idea of layering of the past, a sort of perfect record um, that ebbs and flows according to the present moment. And it seems to take place in a sort of limitless environment, right? That um, at least we have the sense in which our digital environment has unlimited uh, storage, even if it's almost impossible to access the vast majority um, of it. So the other metaphor that Freud uses to discuss this is the metaphor of Rome itself. And he calls Rome the eternal city, that familiar phrase, the eternal city. And the idea here is that Rome is sort of a metaphor for the, for the unconscious and that it contains all of its previous presence and presents them sort of simultaneously. Right? You can see a Renaissance building standing right next to a contemporary glass and steel or uh, modernist glass and steel structure and there's a kind of what we call heterochronicity, right? multiple temporalities happening simultaneously. Because the unconscious is atemporal. There's no differentiation between past and present. That horrific thing that happened to you as a child is just as close to the surface as you know, what happened to you a few minutes ago. There's no sense of a kind of arrangement according to a chronology or history, uh, etc. But again, uh, Freud tells us that this is kind of an imperfect metaphor as well, because for this to really work, all of those previous architectural sites would have to exist in their own present moment, right? So we'd have to see the Florence Cathedral um, in the Italian Renaissance at the same time we see that modernist piece of glass and steel architecture. And we know that this is not really possible. So I bring in uh, these images by Michael Wesley just as a, another way of kind of offering a rejoinder to, to Freud's ideas here. These are um, extremely long exposures, over a year long actually, and he used all sorts of methods to obtain this. He used welding glass, uh, so a very small amount of light is actually getting through um, the lens. And you can see it's, they're almost sort of visualizations of that tension that Freud is talking about, because one of the reasons why the metaphor doesn't work for Freud is that he says an image cannot contain two contents. And so there's a tension here between the legibility of the image and this transcription of time, right? The more time it sort of accumulates, the less readable it becomes. And it's almost the, the perfect visualization of that, uh, that metaphor that Freud was, was pursuing. Actually, before I talk about this important book, and this is the book that I'm going to kind of end with, I want to kind of introduce this more dynamic conception of memory I've been hinting at with, with Freud, a, a form of memory where memory and forgetting are kind of intertwined. We like to think of those as opposed, right? That forgetting is a kind of failure of memory. Forgetting is a lapse in, in memory. Um, but there's a lot of theory coming from psychology uh, and elsewhere that suggests maybe that's not exactly the right way to approach it. And I think Freud, what we just said about Freud, definitely kind of reaffirms that, that idea. So I want to in a very speculative way, present the idea that memory relies upon forgetting in the same way that forgetting relies upon memory. So let's talk about the way in which forgetting relies upon memory. Wow, that doesn't seem to make much sense at all, does it? So let me give you an anecdote here. There's uh, a very famous memory questionnaire that's passed around uh, London by Alan Badele, a very famous memory researcher in the 1980s. He calls it 
the everyday memory questionnaire, and he distributes this to a standardized sort of sample of the general public, all ages, genders, uh, etc. And in it, there are 27 questions that illuminate or speak about sort of common situations of forgetting, losing your car keys, um, having a word on the tip of your tongue, not being able to get it out, etc. And he asks his um, uh, participants to rate on a scale of one to nine how often this happens. At first glance, the results are, are totally typical, as you would expect as the individual gets older, the ability to remember or the propensity to forget, let's say, becomes stronger. But there are two anomalies that catch his eye immediately. First of all, at a very late stage in the game, the ve very elderly, he noticed that memory increases dramatically. That didn't seem to make much sense. And he also noticed that those who had suffered traumatic brain injuries had an incredibly powerful memory. And hopefully you're sort of working this out in your head here. The problem is that this, these two groups did not remember what they had forgotten, right? They, didn't, they couldn't remember uh, the, the, the part of the memory that would allow them to sort of process the fact that it wasn't whole. Do you see where I'm getting at, right? Um, so they, could, they experienced a sort of perfect memory, uh, even though, or at least they, they experienced a perfect memory according to the survey, but in fact this was, was not the case, right? Because forgetting relies upon memory. We have to retain something in order for us to sort of process forgetting as such, right? The other side of the equation is even more interesting, and there's a real thread with modernism which champions forgetting. Uh, and I think this really begins with Nietzsche in the 19th century, his essay uh, on the uses and abuses of history, one of the best titles ever, uh, where Nietzsche admits to sort of envying the cow in the middle of the field. He envies the cow because the cow has no memory and can live in the present and can sort of reconstruct itself endlessly in the future without the burden of the past. And for Nietzsche, this is really an attempt to sort of, he calls for the culture to unburden itself from the excessive weight of 19th century historicism, right? He sees his culture as being burdened down by the baggage of the past and wants to sort of usher in this future self that's based in a kind of productive forgetting. He calls it living unhistorically, right? Uh, fast forward a bit, Marc Auger, the anthropologist, puts this in really uh, poetic terms. He says, memories are crafted by oblivion as the outlines of the shore are created by the sea. Oblivion is the life force of memory and remembrance, its, pro its product. So if we think about this in really pragmatic terms, this is something that the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler says, in order for us to process something as mem memory, there has to be some sort of decay that happens in that event. Right? It has to be somewhat murky, somewhat distant, because if it's not, it's present, and we experience it as present. So there has to be a kind of incompleteness just for it to be experienced as, as memory. So memory is connected to forgetting in a very dynamic way. So we're left with this kind of confounding version of memory that's incredibly dynamic, uh, inter based on a kind of interpenetration of memory and forgetting. So how do we then bring photography into this relationship. And I think this is where probably the most famous book uh, written on this subject, maybe one of the most famous books about photography in the 20th century uh, comes in, and that's Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida, uh, obviously a play on, on Camera Obscura. This is a really hard book to classify. It's great to look out in the audience and see so many students, because I know many of you have read this book and we've read it together. And I always like to sort of present it as, as a record that you can kind of put your needle down wherever you want and have a meaningful experience. And I know that metaphor probably means nothing to my students, but I continue to use it. Um, this book is it, it's, it's part memoir, it, it's part theoretical text, uh, it's part love letter to photography. It has that very difficult balance of first person narrative, theoretical text, and so on. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. And what I want to do in this last section is to put a few passages on the board, um, give you a sense of kind of how I interpret them, and hopefully you'll see how this jives with the kind of larger conception of memory I've, I've been tracing uh, this afternoon. And the reason I want to put the text up is the text is just amazing. You know, you, you can read it over and over again, and it's so seductive and poetic. So Bart says, in photography, I can never deny that the thing has been there. There is a superimposition here of reality and the past. 
And since this constraint exists only for photography, we must consider it by reduction as the very essence, the norm of photography. What I internalize in a photograph is neither art nor communication, <clears throat> it is reference, which is the founding order of photography. The name of photography's noam, it will therefore be that has been. So this is infinitely quoted, this is sort of a distillation of the whole project in many, in many ways. So he mentions, mentions cinema here, and that's an important sort of distinction to make because he talks about, first of all, not really being a fan of film in many ways relative to photography, which he is relatively obsessed with. Film unravels in the present, right? We experience those images as if they're happening before our eyes, whereas photography is immediately coded as past, right? It tells us something that happened previously. And that's really the source of this superimposition that he's talking about between reality and, and past. And this very curious phrase, that has been, he's really sort of poking fun almost at photographic criticism that starts with communication or aesthetic quality. So, you know, looking at an Ansel Adams photograph and marveling at the technical prowess or the symmetry of the composition really misses the point for Barb. Or looking at it as a historical document, looking at uh, Matthew Brady's images to you know, try to sort of decipher the military formations of the Civil War or something like that, also kind of misses the point. Photography is about a kind of temporal relationship. It's about this kind of fold between past and present. And it's connected to death because it essentially presents the moment as irretrievable, right? It presents a moment to you that you can never relive. And it's a reminder of the sort of finite quality of life uh, for that, that reason. Now, there's an interesting uh, issue to bring up here because this was written in, uh, or published in 1980. And as many of you know, especially those of you in the postmodernism class this semester and previous semesters, this is really kind of the beginning or maybe even the height of postmodernism, poststructuralism. Uh, where you know, the realism of the image is, is highly suspect and everything is sort of being deconstructed. And Camera Lucida, I think, is really shortchanged in that environment because there's a kind of skepticism, uh, a kind of interpretation that sees Barth as regressing to this earlier state where the photograph sort of testifies in an objective way. But I think that's a, that's a real misreading, and luckily that's kind of come out in recent critiques of, of the book. So let me read you these couple quotes here, and then I'll, I'll try to kind of un unravel what he's getting at here in terms of this relationship of photography uh, to reality. He says, it's as if the photograph that always carries its referent with itself, the thing it's trying to represent, both affected by the same amorous or funereal immobility. At the very heart of the moving world, they are glued together limb by limb, like the condemned man and the corpse in certain tortures, or even those pairs of fish, sharks, I think, according to Michelet, which navigate in convoy as though united by an eternal coitus. And I searched so hard to find an image for this, but was, was unable to. The photograph then becomes a bizarre medium, a new form of hallucination, false on the level of perception, for all the reasons that I enumerated earlier, true on the level of time, a temporal hallucination, so to speak, a modest shared hallucination. On the one hand, it's not there. On the other hand, but it has indeed been a mad image chafed by reality. So all of these sort of indirect metaphors, it's not, or it's not saying that the photograph objectively represents its subject in any way, but it testifies to this thing having been, right? And it doesn't do anything beyond that. It doesn't say here's an objective, neutral representation of that event or person it testifies to it. It's shaped by reality. So um, it's not as if this is a sort of perfect representation of the past. But this is exactly what allows for the kind of overlap between the past and the present that he uh, discusses. So perhaps the best way to represent this is to say that the photograph is a prompt. Uh, it provides a kind of trail of breadcrumbs that interjects the past into the present and thereby provides the occasion for memory without necessarily providing the memory itself. Rather than a prosthetic or perfect memory, it's a kind of trigger which elicits the processes of memory without necessarily preserving the past per se. 
And I think this is definitely the thrust of Roland Barthes, uh, an author that, coincidentally enough, David Allen references in his thesis quite often. He says, Barthes this is, says, the winter photograph was my Rodney, the um, figure from mythology who gives the thread to Theseus so that he can find his way out of the maze. Not because it would help me discover a secret thing, monster, or treasure, but because it would tell me what constituted that thread which drew me toward photography. And I'll give the last word here to David Allen. This is a quote from his MFA thesis from 1990, where he basically reiterates the same idea, or a very similar idea. He says, by creating images that attempt to express presences of the past in the present, I wish to feel the melding of past and present. I am the sum of the past, and I perceive it presently. In discussing the figure a poem makes, Robert Frost wrote, like a piece of ice on a hot stove, the poem must ride on its own melting. Although daguerreotypes are frozen moments of time and place, the figure they make rides on the dissolving of time and space, while retaining a poignancy of presence which provides a connection between the past and the present. Thank you. to hear your comments, questions, additions. Those of you who have had me in my, in my class, a lot of times. <laughs> I know. My students know I will wait, though. <laughs> I'm a patient man. <laughs> Sam, you have something on the tip of your tongue. Well, I, I know I'm digging. Um, I, it's just I'm trying to process an awful lot of stuff um, about the referent. Um, and there's another wonderful uh, quote about uh, it's laminated to it. Um, uh, I can't finish it, sorry. Um, and I, I, I just need to sort of take it in a little bit more. I don't have yeah. anything formulated yet. I just have a lot of questions. And I, I okay. Know. So, how, how do you feel the power, you know, like when, I, when you talk about photography and memory, you know, I think like a lot of theories about like this photography as such, but as a photographer, and are looking at David Allen's like portraits. Yeah. I know how much power there is in the way you take the picture. Like if I took a picture from here, from below, you might look fat, you know. And I just posted in a gallery Facebook. You're welcome to look at that. So it's like, you know, I'm wondering what do you think about the true and not this documentation, but the interpretation of the reality and mm -hmm. and and on the power of whoever is taking the picture. That's a really interesting point, because uh, Bart says very early on that he has no interest in taking pictures himself. And I think that really colors the text in, a, in an indirect way, um, because he doesn't talk about the operation of photography. And when he tells us, you know, a photograph's not about its content, it's about a temporal relationship, well, I think photographers might struggle a bit with that idea, right? Where photography, at least in its most immediate sense, is so much about composition, technical aspects, uh, and on and on and on. Um, so, you know, I would probably say that's a kind of weakness of the text in that by disregarding content, um, he sort of brackets the whole experience of photography. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm being a little melodramatic here because I think he would probably say that the content is secondary to this temporal relation. And to me that makes a lot of sense because the way we read the content is so colored by the unique temporality of photography, right? Um, take the same content and present it in a moving image. Wow, what a, what a transformation that has. So what is it about the specific aspect of a still photographic image that seems to maintain this kind of connection to memory? And that's what he's interested in this text. Whether or not it's, it's a kind of perfect totalizing theory of photography, I'm not sure. And I think your point is it was probably a, Good one. Now, maybe yeah. you could help me with this conundrum that really kind of relates to all of art. Um, and, you know, Bart talks about the, the punctum, and it's this private 
personal, unique to the individual moment that just sort of it, it goes beyond reason and takes you to this sort of emotional place. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's so it's kind of vague in a way because he you know he never shows you the winter garden picture right, right. he just describes <clears throat> its import its impact on him and of course you know the experience of engaging any work of art is either you know it leaves you cold or you see all kinds of connections that are yeah. in it through your own personal history or memory um, and so I'm just thinking that it's not all that different. It's not oh so specific to photography um, it, um, in this moment I am. It just sort of occurred to me. Yeah. So, yeah, Sam's referencing something else that the book uh, centers on really in the first third or so. He, he sets up this contrast between what he calls studium and punctum elements of Photograph studium is essentially content. It's it's what you see, and the punctum is this sort of what we call affective layer, the emotional response, this highly again individualized subjective experience, which he refuses to really tell us much about in the context of his of the Winter Garden photograph. But he does give, give us some examples, and from those examples, I think it is uniquely photographic. For example, he's talking about a James Van Der Zee photograph, and he points out these totally random idiosyncratic sort of details of the image that pierce him in this punctum-esque sort of way. The buckles on the woman's shoe, for example, if you remember that one. Um, you know, these superfluous elements that are not necessarily critical to <laughs> understanding the image as a whole. It's this kind of almost <coughs> irrational, pre-conscious relationship to images. And so, you know, is that kind of reading an image possible, reading of an image possible in, say, cinema? Right, where images are sort of flowing at you so quickly. So I think there is this sort of stillness of the photograph that allows for that affective, emotional, intense concentration on these very singular kind of details. But, you know, Roland Barthes is the perfect audience for a photograph. Um, you know, he talks about looking at photographs for hours, right? Um, he is the ultimate sort of connoisseur and I think maybe that doesn't really describe our everyday experience of images, but it does speak to this additional layers that come out from the image once you engage it in, in that way. What do you think, Sam? Is that, do you think the punctum is uniquely photographic or? Well, not? I mean, I see your point. Um, uh, I guess I'm trying to think of some of David's images here and, and you know, what those do for me um, in that way, um, yeah. and I've, I've just been reading some other things lately that make me feel that that experience might be more universal than just <coughs> photography, so um, yeah. I do see your point. Um, um, I just I have to sort of think about it some sure. more. I think. Sure. Memory. I was going to ask this really interesting this idea of the past in the present, and you speak both of Bart. The reference is in the photograph. It always carries <coughs> it, and you make this very interesting comparison to Freud, mm -hmm. who talks about Rome, and it's all there. All the layers are there. Mm -hmm. The past is all there. But it really isn't, because he says that you can't have two things going on at the same time. Right. So these two ideas seem to me to be a nice comparison, but contradictory. That's the first thing. And it's because Freud's metaphor is already a contradictory one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My question is really how you see in David Allen's photographs <coughs> The way in which the, the past is present here. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and I think it really speaks to you know, memory as an individual subjective kind of experience. Um, 
if this same show were to travel to another university, what a different experience it would, it would create, right? So, you know, memory is about resuscitating the past within the present to the extent that we have those previous experiences. Maybe not all photographs sort of conjure the past in that way. And so, to look at David Allen's images, I think it's so much about the context. Um, and the operation of the camera, kind of following Bart, um, almost aids in that, that process of memory and that it creates that fold of time where the present and the past commingle with one another, um, which makes possible, it's, it's so hard to say in a definitive way, what, what kind of experiences of the past do the images jar in you? Well, we can't universalize in that way, and that's really the, the problem of talking about memory in a theoretical kind of, kind of way. Resist totalization, resist a kind of universal prescription or diagnosis. Um, so it's best, I think, to talk about these sort of structural relationships, right? So it's about a kind of overlap in the, uh, the present and the past and a prompt to remember what happens after that. Well, it's really a sort of case-by-case -case basis. Yes? Um. I find it really interesting when you talk about memory. Um, it strikes me as, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that you pose it primarily as an individualized process. Mm -hmm. I'm a social scientist, I'm an anthropologist, so um, my interest in memory is as a collective process. Yeah, yeah. That uh, our memory of the past is as much formed by processes of selection, of power, of collective forgetting as well as collective yes. remembering. And so um, I'm curious as to how do theorists of photography engage sort of the making of collective history? Because that's, yes. that's a conversation that's um, driven with power dynamics. That has nothing yes. necessarily to do with how we individually, our brain works. That's how we are conditioned as social cultural beings. You know, if we look at an image of the Civil War, do what do we see, <laughs> right? right? And yeah. which of the, how have those um, images been produced? Um, to what end? Um, and which images have been selected to continue to our present? Yeah. I mean, those are all sort of social kinds of processes. So I'm curious how you would bring together sort of your focus on individual yeah. remembering. Yes. Um, and sort of the, the social collective process. Great question. I mean, it is problematic to isolate the individual. And, and really, you could say I contradicted myself because just by virtue of talking about photography as a kind of universal medium, it is the populist medium that creates these sort of temporal relationships that I'm talking about. So it's immediately social at that, at that point. Um, but having said that, some of the, the um, aspects you just mentioned, to me, I would, I would describe in terms of history. You know, the elisions from the official record, what is passed on, what is made available. There is a kind of, that sounds more historical to me than, than memory. And obviously, this is a slippery slope here, right? Um, you know, memory is intertwined with the record and, and to some, some extent. And so, can, you know, it's difficult to isolate even memory from history and the individual from the collective. You're absolutely right. Those are, those are really hard things to, to, to grapple with. But what I'm really doing methodologically here is a kind of media studies approach where media are seen as materializations of certain discourses, right? Certain ways of understanding memory uh, and so on. Um, and so the individual brings a certain set of circumstances to that relationship, but the relationship itself is kind of communal and collective. And, so yeah, it's shot through with social relations at every stage, as history is with memory. And so it's very hard to make those distinctions, I think. Yeah, come on. Um, so along the same lines, you know, I also, as, as you were presenting this beautiful part, I was thinking about the fact that in these photographs, obviously, we see a form of aestheticization of the past. The past is romanticized, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. I mean, these photographs are absolutely fascinating. But when you think about documentary for photography, for example, when you think about photography in times of war and violence, when people capture something really, really horrifying, I mean, what, what, what kind of 
differences should we see in that kind of photography vis-a-vis -vis this kind of photography, which obviously romanticizes a moment in the past? Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think Roland Barthes would, would answer that a certain way. I, I think, and maybe that's not the way to approach your question in terms of how we remember. Um, you know, part of this idea of memory is that it's also future oriented, right? I mean, the way the way we remember the past has a lot to do with our current identity and our sort of future conception of ourselves and how it's actualized in, in the future. And maybe the difference there is that these horrific images that we mentioned. Um, wars, etc., kind of beg for an actualization in the future. They beg for a kind of response. They beg for an action, Abu Ghraib, right? They beg for us to do something <coughs> about them. Whereas a lot of the images that Barth focuses on um, maybe don't have that trigger, right? They elicit a kind of contemplation. And I think like, like David Allen's maybe, uh, they elicit a kind of contemplation of the passage of time, which is not as future oriented. Um, so that's how I would make that distinction that, you know, these images of, of human suffering, of tragedy, they have a kind of prompt toward a future action that maybe is not as memory based. Mm -hmm. And so that's one element where content does, does matter. I think. That's a very good point. You know, and so, you know, there's the sort of the elephant in the room is this death and photography and um, in the exhibition here, there's there's a sadness to the presentation. It's lovely, it's beautiful, but there's this really poignant sadness. And just as Camera Lucida is the same way, there's this tremendous sadness um, that's expressed throughout it. Um, yeah. And that to me is a really interesting, I don't know what to make of it, but that loss, death, and mourning um, are uh, also a big part of Camera Lucida. Definitely, and, and think about where Bart is coming from. It's coming from this sort of structuralist position, which is very rigorous, cataloging these sort of relations of meaning within text and so on. I mean, he catalogs every sentence from an SZ, right, of the, of the is it the, the Baudelaire poem or something? Um, very sort of cerebral. And then we go to this text, Camelucida, which is very emotional. Um, I mean, it's a really intense kind of read at the same time it's, it's theoretical. And I think that's one of the things that's unique about it is that it allows you to talk about emotion in a complex, intellectual, theoretical sort of way, which is obviously a huge part of the experience of, of photographs, at least certain, certain photographs. So I think that's really the power of that text. Yeah? I think it's telling that Barnes is not a photographer, yeah. he's a writer. And he writes with <coughs> metaphor and historical references and obviously a love of a certain twist and a take on words and different associations. Mm -hmm. And it's through that lens that he's presenting a complex idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he's called it camera lucida, and one thinks that it has something to do really with photography. Um, his lens is through the frontal lobe, the left side, that is verbal. But, for instance, when I go out and photograph, probably the last thing in my mind is words. Or they might be fragments of words like, oh, wow, look at that. I can make that work. And it's all back, to back, back of the brain with the visual part is going on. But I can forgive him because <laughs> very few visual artists, photographers, can be as articulate as verbal artists. But for some reason, the verbal artists don't take the same path yeah. of experience that an actual visual artist does. Absolutely. Yeah. And that makes all the difference in the world. 
yeah. I think. Well, he's writing about reception. He's writing yeah. about the way images are received. Well, even still, uh, I do I do couplets of metaphors in mm -hmm. in photography, and I'm very much aware of that. But I know if I when I write about my work, that's a whole different art form, mm -hmm. a whole different ballgame, and a whole different set of sensibilities and sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And they're they're both creating and it's communicating through their creations, but in different in different paths. That's very true. And I think, you know, ideally they sort of amplify one another without, you know, reproducing the creative act in, in the realm of text, which is really impossible. Just hopefully sort of amplify one another. I mean, that's the way I find my experience of reading this is that it really, you know, bolsters my appreciation of uh, images. But you're right, it is a creative act yeah. in itself. And it's through his to, lens. Yeah. He has an idea and he's communicating it. Right, right, definitely. Yes? Um, I'm wondering, you talk a lot about the photography of memory as a trigger, and it seems hard because if you see a painting, you obviously see that the artist took a lot of liberties, whereas in photography, a lot of people seem to assume that that's exactly you know, a still image of what it was, and yet the photographer has a lot of power, a lot of propaganda to, to paint the image in a, in a certain way, a certain light. How, how does that affect? They seem almost opposite. The, sorry, the, the photograph... The way that the photographer can take the photograph in a way to almost shape how the memory is, or how it's viewed as a memory, mm -hmm. but not as an actual... Uh, the way that they, they can put their own spin on it, their own bias. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how that... I see what you're saying, but don't you think painting is open to that as well? No, I do. I think that there's a social viewpoint where photography is assumed to be less, kind of less of the bias. Oh, right, yes. Uh, and I think that's, you're right, it's a social viewpoint. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think it has any less of uh, sort of open to being uh, perverted or changed or at least just sort of a transcription of an individual's perception or being subjective or um, I mean personally I don't think photography is any less open to that than than painting but I think you really nailed it when you said it's a social expectation it's really a cultural sort of convention that we read photography in terms of conventions of realism I mean that might be an oversimplification but you know I think it's pretty dangerous to say that, that photography is less open to sort of, you know, the artist or photographer's own subjective viewpoint. I certainly don't think that's true. Yeah? Uh, just um, with all the discussion going on, the debate that's being posed right now, I think it's kind of interesting to me how you were talking about how, like, the Freudian viewpoint is sort of how that you can't deny that um, certain things have happened, and memory is sort of, it's just uh, how the board is, where all the things that happened are, are there, yeah. no matter what. So I guess, like as a collective, instead of trying to figure out, as a the photograph, but it's trying to, as an individual, trying to say, maybe it's more simply just like all the images collectively, it's just a saying that the event actually happens. It's just yes. a matter of a collection. And that's yeah. how memory works, is, is, an, is not filtering certain things out or having some objective. It's just a, a collection. And I think that that's how certain things are shaped socially. Right. And why certain images um, are more powerful than other images and that sort of thing. So I don't, I don't think it really matters as an individual. You know what I mean? Um, how you're trying to look at it? I think that it's just a matter of documenting that it exists and that that happened. I think that's so right. Right. And I mean, you know, the, the official sort of discourse is, is the idea of the witness, 
the camera bears witness, right? It says this happened, and we all acknowledge this event. Um, and again, that's something different than saying, here's a perfect transcription of the actual event itself. No, the camera just bears witness to this thing having happened. And as you said, there's a kind of collectivity that forms around that. Uh, I think that's absolutely what Barth is, is saying. Uh, but the photograph for Barth doesn't say much beyond that, right? It doesn't give you the truth of Abu Ghraib, uh, but it tells you there was this thing that happened, and it carries the kind of residue of that event without you know, disclosing the authoritative objective image. But, but you're so right about the social process that you know, in collectively recognizing this event as having occurred, then that's where memory steps in. Right, and that's where the past becomes a sort of construct around that image. It's a great way to put it. Yeah? Um, I was drawn to a part of David Allen's quote on the board that says, I'm a subject of the past and I perceive it presently. I was thinking how much photography really does depend on perception. Because yeah. when a photographer is setting up a shot, they want the viewer to perceive it in a certain way. But that's also based on their present perception. But as soon as that photograph is snapped, it's a past perception. Yes. And then when you come to the gallery like this and you're seeing David Allen's photography, you're seeing his present perception, which has become his own past perception, but now it's your present perception, which may change between the times that you look at the picture. So it's interesting the progression of perception through different people in different periods of time within the same person. Absolutely, yeah, that, that layering of, of, of time, even with the same person, it's a great way of putting it. I mean, you, you've all probably had this experience of looking at childhood photographs, right? Where you have to be reminded that that's actually you in the picture, right? Um, whereas at one point, that image would be incredibly familiar to you, maybe the most familiar image. And so, yeah, it's a process, it's a dynamic that is always sort of moving in that Aristotelian sense, just like memory itself. Now, the one other thing I want to just sort of bring up here is that the digital kind of confounds this whole conversation. Um, you know, is a digital image still coded as past when, you know, I snap a picture, it's up in Facebook in half a second of what I'm eating for dinner, and this is happening right now as you read my page, right? Um, there's, it seems as if the photograph, digital photography, maybe is not coded as past in the same way. Maybe it has a new sort of presentness to it. It's almost a kind of live medium in a way because of the digital sphere, but that's another can of worms with something to think about. Any last minute questions? Thank you everyone for coming, this was so much fun. <laughs>